Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning on this, uh, certainly where I am, quite a chilly uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, really grateful for your time to join us today as we launch our latest edition of our social housing barometer. Uh, so uh, the form today is we're just going to uh, take a little bit of time to go through some of the key messages from the barometer and as usual, have a little bit of a Q&A and, and, and uh, with uh, panellists uh, from whom you'll hear a little bit more later and, uh, and then a time to also to pick up any questions or comments that uh, um, people on the call may have for us too. Uh, so I'd very much like to welcome everybody. Uh, Hannah, would you go to the next slide, please? Um, this sets out the order of the day, um, as I uh, have just suggested. and. Um, Perhaps I could draw your attention to the, the box in the, the bottom there about uh, using the chat uh, function to submit any comments or questions as you have as we go along. Uh, we will pick up as many as we can and obviously follow up individually uh, where sensible to do so after the event as well. Uh, everybody is muted on the call. Uh, I, I suspect you'll all be pleased to know um, you sh that should happen automatically, but you may also want to check your own mute functions just to confirm that that is the case. Um, and actually, uh, the other thing I should say, this uh, session is being recorded uh, because we will be sharing uh, the recording either in full or in snippets via our website uh, and various other forums. So um, uh, just so everybody knows. Uh, I think that's it on this slide. If I, next slide, Hannah, please. Uh, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Phil, uh, Phil Cliffins. I'm the national lead for BDO's housing team. Um, well, with uh, well over 20 years experience of working in the sector and working with various uh, key stakeholders within the sector, be that sort of working party or the ICAW committee, the RSH and others. So I work with a large number of clients around the country, uh, some very large, some quite small, all doing different things and, and a real, um, uh, it's been a real area of focus for mine and indeed the firm for a long time now, the sector, and it's a sector we are very, very passionate about working in. So that's me. Uh, I'm joined today by colleagues uh, from within BDO and also delighted to welcome um, Robert uh, from WHE, uh, one of the, the organisations we do work with, and you'll hear more from them in due course. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. So this is the fifth uh, edition of our social housing barometer. Uh, and you know, the, the idea of the barometer was around, um, I guess, taking the sense of temperature, the mood from the sector uh, on some key issues around confidence, around risk, around board priorities and those sorts of things and areas and, and and we're beginning really to get a sense of trend and an and, and ability to see how things are moving over time and obviously as we all know we're living in reasonably fast changing times at the moment um you know two years ago we were talking about, about brexit last year we were talking about covid and i think when we were having this conversation last year we hoped we might not be talking about covid still but clearly and, and sadly we still are so uh, very uh, changing times, lots of interesting things going on in the sector. And so, uh, you know, a good time, I think, for us to, again, be taking that temperature um, of, of what you got, what um, you, you know, House Association of the Sector are, are telling us. So um, we started really with uh, you know, questions around, uh, I guess, economic confidence and the impact on, on development. Um, and, and here you can see on the slide um, uh, quite a mixed picture, actually, when we asked people about how people are feeling about, about the economy and that knock-on effect of development. So, uh, you know, a reasonably large percentage of, of organisations actually do have plans to increase development, um, but equally quite a large number saying they expect to reduce it. So a, a bit of a mixed picture. Actually, that does reflect uh, when you delve a bit further into the data, some regional differences. So I think uh, particularly in London and, and the South East, there's an element of um, uh, more caution, perhaps, that's come through into at least short term development plans. Uh, why is that? Well, I think that hesitancy is influenced by that, uh, a real um, knock, if I can put it like that, in terms of uh, confidence uh, and in the wider economy. Uh, perhaps that's not surprising given um, what we have all been experiencing, but also actually um, some feedback around uh, a lack of good opportunities in areas around and, and also competition uh, with other providers, for-profit organisations in particular in terms of access to land 
and elsewhere. So quite a mixed picture. Uh, when we asked the question around financial services and whether they were um, likely, um, I, I guess, have they been better or worse than perhaps expected? Uh, again, interesting, a number have, have, have seen increased financial services. Um, uh, but again, um, and that is uh, when you delve a little bit into that data, you, you pick up the fact that perhaps that's due to um, repair spend and those sort of things being pushed out a little. Um, but equally, um, we know, and a lot of my clients certainly are budgeting for quite significant uh, fire safety work and, and, and now into the future zero carbon initiatives. And we'll come on to talk a bit more about that later. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. So we always talk a little bit about risk. One of our key questions is around uh, key risks in the sector and where are boards and senior management teams focusing on risk? Uh, and, and, and in a sense, what's, what are your top three, your top five risks, those sort of areas? And, and perhaps it's no surprise that um, a, a constant uh, top risk really over the five years we've been doing this barometer is around health and safety and the whole compliance agenda. And that we've very much seen that return to the top of our risk rankings uh, a top five risk by 70% uh, of our respondents. Uh, but actually, the interesting thing for us this year was a, a bit of a new entry into our top risks around accessing skills and resources is, is possibly uh, the major concern. It's now a key risk for 68% of our respondents. Uh, if I go back and look over our data over the last couple of years, uh, accessing skills and resources would be uh, outside of the top 10 risk, really. It's something that was bubbling along, but not something that had really gone to the top of board's agenda and, and the message was very much loud and clear this time that access to skills and resources across the board is now a key risk for house associations. Uh, actually, it's a key risk, I think, uh, for many organisations in many sectors, but it's definitely biting uh, for house associations and this sector. Um, still a concern around the impact of the wider economy. Uh, it's dropped third place uh, below health and safety and skills and resources. But still, there is a very key risk as, as I guess boards are are thinking about um, how that might impact on uh, their own confidence and indeed their risk appetite. Which interestingly, actually, uh, uh, you know, quite a hefty percentage, 22, have said uh, actually standing back despite the risk landscape that organisations are looking at, uh, their risk appetite has increased. I think that actually says something about the way house associations are embracing change and thinking through change. Uh, and actually said, actually, we do have the ability to withstand more risk and perhaps use our assets uh, and, um, and our people more effectively. Uh, management and board priority. So thinking through, uh, having talked through the risk agenda uh, and then thinking about, well, OK, what are boards therefore focusing on in terms of their own priorities? And perhaps it's no surprise that if one of the greatest risks uh, that has been identified as around managing that health and safety agenda you would elf, therefore clearly expect the board priority to be um, seeing that carried out well and be managed and mitigated appropriately. Uh, scaling up development um, has consistently been uh, a key area of focus. Again, over the number of years we've been carrying out our barometer, you can see there, for example, it's 55% this year, 50% last year, 53% the previous year. So a pretty consistent theme about can we develop more, more properties to meet uh, the affordable homes um demand that we all know is there uh, and um and is um if anything continuing to increase um last comment maybe i'll make on this slide is over 40 percent of respondents saw uh driving efficiency and innovation as a top three item um that's quite a, a reduction from the last couple of years uh that's quite interesting, I think, because uh, I think a lot of certainly the clients I work with have made huge strides in terms of uh, pushing efficiency, whether that's investment in systems um, or, um, or, or um, many other things. But I do think we're only, you know, there's still a lot to do in that area. Value for money will continue to be a key focus for the, air, um, for the sector. It clearly is for the regulator and other stakeholders. And so... Um, I, I'm slightly surprised to see that efficiency and innovation piece drop down, but clearly it may be because there are other priorities. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. This year, as with ever, as ever with our barometer, we, we look at a particular topic in, in a bit more detail and ask a series of questions. And in previous years, we've touched on 
for example, the the, uh, the impact of COVID or um, or um, uh, yeah, kind of uh, joint ventures was a topic we we've looked at in the past. This year, we very much focused on the ESG agenda, um, clearly a very large agenda within this sector and elsewhere. And so we were interested to see uh, warehouse associations were in their thinking and their preparedness for ESG. And I think the interesting piece here is uh, perhaps just uh, about half of house associations now publicly report on ESG related issues. I think that number is definitely growing, uh, but nevertheless, you know, in terms of the formal responses to us, about 50% just under public report, whether that's in their accounts or in another report um, to stakeholders about their ESG related issues. However, when we asked the question about um, have house associations got a formal ESG strategy that's been signed off by the board uh, and is widely understood within the organization, actually that number falls to only 22%. So that's just over one in five house associations have created a formal ESG strategy. A link to that, uh, only um, just under a third have measurable ESG objectives linked to that strategy. So, um, so whilst, uh, so this tells me there's still a lot of work to do in this area um, where there's a sense that it's important. There's a sense that we want to tell people what we're doing, but perhaps we haven't quite got to the stage of being very clear about what we want to achieve, why we want to achieve it, and then how we're actually gonna measure success. Uh, and, and I think um, that's quite an interesting challenge for the sector as we go through. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. So one of the sort of sub questions we asked as part of our ESG agenda was uh, looking at carbon um, neutrality challenge, carbon reduction and said, and ask uh, um, respondents to, to what extent have you assessed the financial impact of those carbon reduction commitments? Um, and I guess the impact on your business plan and the other priorities that perhaps we've just talked about. And, and interestingly, at this stage, only um, just over a quarter of our respondents said they had fully assessed the financial impact of those carbon reduction commitments. Uh, again, that number felt um, um, I, you know, slightly surprising. Certainly the, the conversations I'm having with my clients is there's, there's quite a significant awareness of uh, the potential financial cost and the potential financial impact on business plans as a consequence of this, but perhaps it's still at that high level rather than at a detailed level in terms of really assessing financial impact and what are the consequences of that. And certainly we would be encouraging our clients and others to maybe um, uh, move a little faster in that area because I don't think this agenda is clearly going to go away. Next uh, slide, please, Hannah. So that was a bit of a canter through the key messages um, from our questions. Um, uh, we're going to pick up some of those themes through our question and answer session. Both we've got uh, maybe two or three that we have been thinking about here already to get the conversation going, and then we would be delighted to take um, um, questions and comments as we go through too. Before we do, um, uh, I'd like to introduce our panellists, who I'm sure are now all um, very well prepared in switching their cameras on so they can all say hello. So. Uh, particularly delighted to introduce uh, Robert Gillam, who's the Corporate Director of Business Strategy and Assets at WHG. Really delighted that you've joined us, Robert, and very interested in getting, the, I guess, the client side view of some of the things we have been talking about. Uh, Hamid uh, Gifour, um, who is a partner uh, who I work very closely with across the housing sector, and he leads the, our teams in, um, I think, what we we, we broadly described as the north of England, and, uh, and also um, joined by William Jennings, who's a manager in our team, in our risk assurance team in London, who very much focuses on, uh, I guess, internal audit, advisory, and, and I guess wider kind of systems processes and control and other improvements for our clients. So that's our panel today. Uh, we're gonna uh, kick off with uh, a first question, which I think is on the next slide. Um, and I'm going to just ask quite a gentle, open question to colleagues um, to see, uh, see what people think from those findings that I've just talked through. So uh, perhaps, Hamid, if I could start with you. Um, from the survey findings, and I guess thinking specifically about the risks identified, what stands out to you and are there any surprises? So in terms of the question, um, I don't think there's anything that necessarily uh, surprised me. Um, I think 
what I would say is that I think the maybe the, the magnitude of some of the some of the risks talked about, I would expect it a little bit higher profile. It's interesting. For example, I think the financial piece is, is interesting at the moment. I think there's uh, a lot of pressure on organisations because of inflation. There's a lot of pressure on organisations in, in terms of development uh, and additional costs and supply and demand shortages. And um, and all that piece, uh, well, whilst in the, in, 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 in the survey, um, and probably maybe, I know in the survey itself, there's some wider comments around, so maybe people expanded that. I think that's a real, from the organisations that I'm talking to, that's a real concern. And what, what's interesting is that, I think over the last, I'd say over the last 10 years, most social housing providers financially have been relatively, st- are strong. Social housing is an incredibly strong sector and that, and that came through in the way it's managed COVID uh, in particular. Sure. But it's interesting talking to organisations at the moment that they are concerned about um, margins in the next couple of years, being hit by some of these, you know, by inflation. And also from the inflationary perspective, they're in a little bit of a country uh, in, in, in terms of the, the impact of this on tenants um, and, and affordability for tenants. And, and, and I know some of the organisations I've been talking to about have talked about, well, whether we should be passing our whole uh, the rent increase across to, to, yeah. to tenants because of the higher um, um, CPI this year as well. So I think that is really, really challenging uh, and something that organisations is certainly getting to the forefront. And that combined with some of the other stuff you talked about, some of the, the ESG stuff, in particular the environmental piece um, around and the additional costs coming through that, I think means that you know, providers more so than ever in the future are going to have to make some real choices around what they're looking to do and what they can do in the future. Yeah, thank you, Hamid. And perhaps, I mean, I've got some thoughts on that, but perhaps, uh, Robert, have you got any observations from, from I guess, you know, working actually within a house association where you sit here from a kind of advisor's perspective? Yeah, so um, in terms of those priorities, I think the health and safety one is, um, in a way, it's not a surprise, but it's also a good thing to see it up there because um, f- from our point of view, you know, there's a real drive for us to get on Um, and independently without waiting for regulation to address the key health and safety issues that we've been dealing with in the sector. Um, I think as well, um, uh, we've kind of had to make our own uh, governance arrangements and decisions about this, so really kind of get ahead of um, things like the Building Safety Bill. So seeing that as a priority um i'm not surprised and it's something that i think we're all grappling with along with all the other challenges so i think that's the that's the issue as well um how do we balance out our expenditure on things like that along with um you know dealing with covid and all the challenges that we've had as a as a sector around that and then of course uh, looking at the carbon neutral agenda so balancing all those things but making sure that health and safety is top of our priorities uh, feels really right to me. The skills and resources one is an interesting one because I think as a sector we've probably been pretty protected by this but the more that we have broadened some of the skills that we've brought into the sector the more we are competing now with other industries and of course some of those skill shortages that we've always known about around trade skills are really hitting us now and that strong competition in those trade arenas um, has made it really difficult coupled with the fact that we are now having catch up um, in terms of some of those um, key service areas. So we've got pent up demand, backlogs of work, and we're competing against, uh, you know, a lot of other industries. So some real challenges there. Gosh, bro, that's a really challenging mix. I agree. So um, um, William, have you got anything to add? And then um, maybe I'll come back in. And I think, I think, I'd agree with obviously Hamid, Hamid and Rob, um, but but juggling those competing priorities, I think, is going to be is going to be the real issue for boards over the next twelve to twenty four months. Because I don't think you can you can realistically address all of those issues at the same time. Um, you know, health and safety, the skills and resources one, um, sort of demonstrates that we should be concerned about manage our expectations about being able to drive on with asset reinvestment and development programs, um, driving our data transformation, um, whilst at the same time, 
um, you look through the management board priorities and, and you don't see things like data or, or managing the organizational growth as an idea coming through. So I thought, I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, and it's, I agree. And it's interesting. I think when we, we carried out this survey, uh, I think the data collection was in kind of September time. And, um, and it's interesting how things already moved quite quickly. So uh, I think Hamid touched on um, inflation, for example. And certainly I, my sense is that that is, that is really emerging um, as a risk uh, and, and a sense that that could really um, hurt in, in the next couple of years of business plans is inflation moves on and, and, and then when you lay that into some of those priorities that, that Rob and, and, and you've been talking about, about how do you balance priorities when at the same time you know that everything is going to get more expensive. So um, definitely a challenging time and I think it's going to be a really interesting challenge for boards to just work out where they place their emphasis both in the short and the long term and be very clear about their strategies in terms of how that all connects and what the golden thread is through their thinking. Um, Okay, let's move to the next question. Um, so um, again, uh, so we just talked about risks as we can, you know, that transition to board priorities and, and where should board, where are boards prioritizing their time and where, uh, you know, the data told us where, where boards uh, were prioritizing the time, health and safety and compliance, scaling up development being the top two areas. But um, is there anything that didn't come through in the survey that you might have expected? Again, um, Hamid, I'll start with you because I know you had a uh, kind of quite a strong feeling about one particular area which you thought might have come through a bit more. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, there was a people piece, the well-being piece around, around people. So when I've talked to organisations, um, the, the register providers I, I work for or work with, um, that appears to be quite high on on the agenda, and and that to me that obviously that continues in terms of the last eighteen months and, and going into the future. But and and also about the way people are working, a more agile way of working moving forward, and it's it's yeah the new normal, whatever. Different organisations are different things. Um, so I would have expected, I think, that coming through far stronger. I don't know if it's got merged into one of the other areas in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the survey itself, but it it didn't. I, I didn't sense that coming through in terms of the some of those headings that we have and some of the the movements around. Um, but but to, but to me, when I when I've talked to organisations. The, the piece around, I think um, Robert talked about this about making sure you're attracting the skills. A, a key element of that is is the culture of these of, of organisations and how they work and 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 the flexibility in those these organisations. And I, I always my, my view of social housing, having actually worked in social housing myself for a couple of years as well, is that that's always been pretty pretty good. Um, but it needs to adapt as you move forward in terms of because other I think. What's interesting, you look at the commercial side, the private organisations, um, because of what's happened in the last 18 months, they're really catching up they're in terms of, uh, and, they, and they really have got massive, I mean, BDO, for example, massive focus in terms of how we work, agile working, being more flexible, supporting people. That whole piece is, is a massive element of what we, we do. So, but I didn't really see that come through in the survey, I suppose that's, that's, that's my bit around it. Yeah, I mean, and Rob, I guess again from perhaps the the car side, does that does that make sense to you? Is that what Hamid's saying? It it absolutely does, and and I think it's the piece that you know when I look at this, it's the piece that I'm surprised isn't there. Although I would say. Uh, it's probably emerging now, and uh, and certainly as an organisation, we're looking at this because it's it's everything from the impacts of hybrid working to how how do we as we as you say attract new people um that that you know want, want some of the kind of new approaches to work at the same time as addressing the issues around organizational culture you know we're a, very much housing associations built on um a culture people who want to work in a kind of um an organization that gives back to communities that's a people organization with a social conscience and so we connect, you know, there's a lot of connection that goes on in our business that adds value to the work that we do. And I think exploring that now 
we're just getting to a point where we're, we're beginning to kind of understand what this uh, hybrid agile working looks like. How do we maintain that bit of the organisation that's kind of the heart of what we do? Yeah. And um, so in a way, perhaps the timing of it, I think we're probably all just getting there in terms of realising we need to do additional work and really think about how we build that in as opposed to we've probably um, got a bit comfortable in the way that it kind of exists in our organisations historically. Thank you, Rob. And, and I guess, um, uh, was there anything else from your perspective that you thought could have come through um, stronger in the survey, given your own experiences? I mean, one of the, I mean, I know, I know certainly if, um, if they are director of ops who is responsible for IT was here, she'd be saying the whole cyber security thing, you know, we, we are, it's certainly a conversation we're having regularly within the organisation. Uh, you know, we are aware of the, the kind of the focus and the, and the potential for that. And, and, you know, connecting that with fraud, you know, and the current um, working arrangements and the environment that we're working in at the moment, uh, both of those, there's, there's potential weaknesses that we, need to make sure that we're very alert to. Yeah, thank you for that, Rob. And I don't, William, I'm sure that's a sort of fertile territory for, 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 for where you tend to focus. Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the things I was going to highlight as well. So I'm comforted to hear Rob say that and and I know Faye well and, and that's something that she focuses on a lot. because um, you could see data coming through as one of the key risks with 57% saying you know it's a key risk for our organization. Um, and then perhaps perhaps the focus on that is baked into the driving efficiency and innovation part. But we hear the regulator talk all the time about the importance of data and understanding data. And, and we can see a direction of travel around big data and using data in more innovative ways to measure assurance and drive customer service. So I was a bit surprised to see that not come through as a top board priority. But um, it's also link, it, it's, it's one of those areas that you could talk for hours about um, and it's so closely linked to ways of working as well because um, it's going it's the way that data is used will change the way in which colleagues yeah. and, and people who work in the sector do their roles. So um, I suppose transformation and, and data was one of the points I was, I was expecting to see come through a bit but perhaps it's baked into the innovation response. Yeah, I think the transformation piece was something that stood out to me. In the fact that if I think through the you know the housing organisations I work with, there is a degree of pace of change going through those those organisations, both in terms of uh, you know as I said, systems but ways of working and, and trying to think differently about how to achieve outcomes for customers and, uh, and and maybe that's a sort of overarching theme. And actually, all of those other sort of areas that people have responded as priorities all feed into that, but. You can. I definitely get this sense around ch a changing environment, and and um, um, uh, and I guess then you get into well, how do you manage change effectively, and how do you get the outcomes that, that people want for customers, for staff, and uh, uh, and other stakeholders. And I think that that's probably for me a key thing that I thought could, could could have come through more strongly in itself. But I think it's kind of touched on in each of the sort of individual kind of areas that that. Um, that, that came through in, in, as I was talking through the slides. Okay, uh, we've got, uh, there's one more question on the slides, but I just want to remind people that they do have the opportunity to uh, drop comments or questions on the chat before we do um, move to that third question. So thank you, Hannah. Um, our last question that we sort of thought about uh, was very much to pick up that kind of very specific and um, hot topic around ESG. Um, uh, clearly a big area of focus for, for this sector and indeed all sectors. Um, it's certainly something, for example, we're working um, very uh, closely on in terms of our video and our own thoughts around ESG, both as a, as a firm, but also the way we interact with our clients. So uh, the question was, being a socially minded sector with an existing regulatory focus on governments, does the EA, ESG agenda offer something new? And, uh, Rob, I don't know if I'm put you on the spot to go first, but have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I think the ESG agenda has helped us kind of draw together um, the priorities that we're working on at the moment. So I think that's been really helpful. Um, in terms of does it bring something new? It's really interesting. We started looking at the ESG 
um, frameworks quite a while ago. And from our point of view, we were looking, as we were beginning to explore our, our carbon neutral journey, um, one of the challenges that we've got is looking at how we kind of um, put some metrics around progress and achieving and milestones and, that, and, how, and the pace of the journey. And so we very much looked at some of the metrics around the ESG agenda as a way of kind of linking to that and giving the board some a framework to understand what that journey looked like, but also the kind of progress and being able to, to really uh, manage that the, the performance around that. So in terms of ESG generally, I mean, it plays very much to the strengths of the sector. You know, we, you know, we, are, we are an organisation with strong governance, a sector with strong governance. Yeah. And of course, that's strengthening through now with the whole customer voice really becoming a, a priority again. I mean, it's a shame that it kind of um, went a bit quiet, but, you know, definitely a refocus on that customer voice. Um, so strong governance and regulation um, in terms of um, that kind of social investment, you know, that is very much the DNA of what we do. We're not that good all the time at actually um, telling the story and explaining it. So I think ESG gives us a real opportunity to bring that a bit more to the forefront in terms of some of the really pioneering work that housing associations do in communities, the contribution they make. And that intrinsic link between that work and being a landlord and our kind of the stakeholder relationship that, that we hold in many, in many uh, communities and neighbourhoods. Mm -hmm. um, I think the challenge, if anything, has been the response to the environment, um, you know, that, that element of, of this agenda. Um, and certainly, you know, for most organisations, it was really interesting seeing the responses um, from the sector to your survey, which is really getting underneath. What is the challenge? What is the size of it? What is the cost of it? And how do you begin to, to get that into your business plans when we know that... Um, you know, from an organisation like us, it's a it is you know we we've done that groundwork, so we understand what the what the needs of our stock is, and it is absolutely significant, and it makes a massive difference to the business plan. It's a huge challenge, and it's affecting our thinking about other commitments, like for example, long term development and strategic partnership, and our ability to flex our resources. So, I think you know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework that plays to our strengths as a sector, but I also think it's probably posed some real challenges and focus on that longer term horizon scanning about where we need to be. Another question, which is, you know, linked to that, Rob, do you think that there are any kind of reputational risks um, associated with not being seen to be doing things about ESG for housing associations? I mean, there, there are always, I mean, um, as a housing association in what is a very kind of ambitious um, and restless sector, there's always the reputational challenge of what is the latest thing and how do you keep up with it? I think the really important thing here is around the kind of the independence and governance of the board and what is the right time and, and way for an organisation to work its way through something like this. So for us, you know, we... Um, we, we, we're not when we don't need at the moment to go to the market for funding. Um, we recently took part in a blend funding um, arrangement, which did use some of the ESG criteria. Um, but but for us, it's very much really using this framework to strengthen what we already do. And as I say, to um, to kind of support that framework around what does progress, particularly on the environment and some of those um, corporate social um, investments how do we use that to actually help the board govern and manage the organization and to show progress so um, yeah there are reputational challenges and we need to make sure that we you know we nobody wants to be last to join these things yeah. um, there are purposes for doing it around funding um, but doing it really for the you know what what kind of reinforcing what your organisation is about it seems to me to be more important. Um, I mean, we're looking at the, the framework for sustainability for housing, um, which is a bit more bespoke to our industry and relevant to the things that we do. Um, some of the early uh, um, 
you know, frameworks are perhaps not quite as relevant to the sector. And we want to make sure that the, whatever framework we use actually reinforces um, our mission as a, as, a, as a social housing landlord. I think with ESG, I think what's interesting I think, for the ESG bit piece for me is that it's massive focus on the, on the environmental bit. But I'm not, I'm, I, I, but I'm not getting a sense of the ESG is environmental social governance, not just environmental. Where's the social element coming in? And where's the governance element coming in? And, what, and I don't get, a, my sense is I'm not getting, a, I'm seeing the focus on environmental because that's, you know, obviously in the news and that's what people are focused on, et cetera. But the social element around people goes back to the well-being point, goes, back, goes to diversity and everything that's happened the last 18 months in, in terms of organisations, social housing, I'm going to say something a bit controversial now, but social housing is great to talk about diversity. I've been involved in the sector 25 years. We've been talking about it for 25 years. We've got all these policies, but are we seeing it? Are we really seeing it at, at board? Are we really seeing it at lead, at lead, in leadership? I, I, I question. Um, I think the piece around, and governance, if we're going to this new way of working, the environmental piece, the social piece, where's the governance bit coming into ESG as well? Where, how is that flow, flowing through? I know this is early days at the, at the moment, but we need to be thinking about all three, all three of these elements link together. Uh, and, my, and my sense is that I'm, not, I'm, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of work and people are still working in the way they worked before. And there are some organisations out there that have been really progressive, I think, in, in looking at this, starting to look at this in, in that way as an overall but I think the majority sector hasn't really started doing that. And I think that's what the survey's telling us, really, actually, that at this stage, there's a lot, you see it's an agenda item that people are really thinking about, but there's still quite a bit of work and thinking and depth of thinking, perhaps, to, to go in each of those areas. And I, I agree with you about the S, bit, the social bit. And I know, William, you and I were talking a little bit about, I guess, one of the, some of the respondents were about um, kind of the national living wage, for example, and the number of house associations that are kind of signed up to that and actually well it's not all housing associations so so you know there is that kind of social contract with people as, as part of the ESG piece that I think still needs a bit more uh, some clarity about about how that message is communicated. No I agree and I think the sector as a whole um, probably wants to be on the front foot in demonstrating that case around social value um, particularly as we potentially enter into more economic uncertain times and with high inflation rates um but yeah i completely agree with hamid as well i think when when the survey and the report gets released you'll see that there are on their faces really strong responses across some of the s and the g points but when you when you flip them upside down and you say well that means one in four housing associations or one in six housing associations or respondents don't do x you know, and that X might be take active steps to make sure that the board reflects um, the diverse nature of its of, of the customers it's serving. Um, some, sometimes some of these metrics don't look so positive. So you might you might challenge the sector to to think that it needs to do more in this area. And I suppose what I'd add to this is that that, that piece around some of this stuff like the social piece in, uh, in particular was, was the domain of, you know, if you compare 20 years ago, you compared the social piece in the housing association to what a private company did or a private organization did with who are, um, who are serving shareholders. This, this, there was a massive difference, but this isn't just a, a social housing agenda item. This is a, 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 a overall, you've got your know, FTSE companies focusing on this and, and there's, there's that bit around, how housing associations keep themselves differentiated from from other these other organisations about being different and there's a competitive piece here that I don't think has really been thought through. Yeah, no, I agree with that, Hamid. Um, so definitely an area of focus. I think something might we might return to, or we definitely will return to, um, perhaps next year in the Bromans and futures, just to see how people are, you know, how it's moved and shifted because I think it will keep moving and shifting over. The next uh, two or three years pretty quickly actually and and i think robert i think you said earlier that no one wants to be last in in this and all this sort of place but uh, my sense almost is that i'm not sure many people want to be first either and it's kind of people people are sort of wanting to be kind of fast followers in this area and kind of and um, almost almost work out uh, where people have made the odd mistake having gone down a rabbit warren or, or spend more money than they need to in a particular area then there can be a lot of learning and a, a sense um, certainly on the e, on the e bit, I think this will be a bit of that, and and um, um, 
you know, that learning will come through into the sector over the next couple of years, I think, across the board. But that's a personal observation, I think. Um, okay, so we've got one question in the chat still. Uh, again, please do possibly add um, in. Uh, please don't use the Q&A function because that is, I think, um, doesn't always connect. So there is a chat function as well if people want to add questions. But the question we've got, I guess, in terms of all the things we've been talking about, um, what's the best way for boards to set out decision making around competing investment opportunities? And um, again, I guess, again, Rob, if you're talking to your board, how do you help them set out? Uh, I guess, you know, we've talked about uh, development, we've talked about uh, ESG, we've talked about health and safety, we've talked about um, the impact of inflation, uh, we've talked about cyber and IT. And so, so how do you, how do you, engage a board and enable them to make the best decisions within all of those competing priorities? Okay, uh, th this is, um, I mean, it is, a, <laughs> it is a really interesting question, this one, because of course, most boards, they have really strong ambitions in each one of these areas. Mm -hmm. So what you find is if you talk about an, an item in isolation, we want to press on with it, we want to be the best in it, we want, you know, we want to lead in it, we want, you know, we want to throw all of the organisation's resources at it. And then, of course, you move on to the next thing. So that might be development. Then you move on to the retrofit agenda and, and the yeah. environment and same again. Um, and so to me, the really important thing is keeping those conversations with the board at that very strategic and linked level so that they, they're kind of you're constantly talking about the links between these things. I mean, really interesting. We had a conversation at executive and board around becoming a strategic partner yeah. um, for development. We are a strategic partner at the moment, but for the next wave. And um, one of the things that we talked about was how that might tie our hands in terms of future decision-making and, and, and investment and resources. Um, and was that the right thing for the board to do? And I think that was, that was, uh, you know, it was a bit of a game changer in terms of a conversation with the board because it's that thing about, do you know what? Number one, we can't do everything at once and there is a real sequencing and pace to some of this stuff. Um, and the other thing is we need to make sure that the decisions we're making give us options because if you think about the, you know, the, for example, the Carbon Zero Agenda, we've got a pretty robust plan to 2030. Beyond that, um, you know, it's difficult for anyone to plan. We don't know what the te technologies are going to be like. Yeah. We don't know what government funding is going to be available. We don't know what the rent um, situation is going to be. So there's all these unmeasurables that we're working with. Um, so you need to be able to have flexibility in the board to be able to make those decisions. So that, that to me, that kind of forced a real conversation about how do we make sure that the board still have options as they go forward and look at that priority and the other thing is that really long-term horizon scanning because I think one of the challenges around coming through that Covid period is we've done an awful lot of looking at the immediacy of what to do next yeah. um, and and you know it's really important at the moment that we look up and look at those long horizons and see what is coming and how do we as I say sequence and plan out over a longer term and and for us that very much links to our corporate planning and and you know you'll know phil that we we put a lot of store by our corporate plan yeah. we spend yeah. a lot of time developing it we review it um, and we will be developing the next one very shortly um so making sure that you know we are managing for now but really looking for that mid and long-term future Thank you, Rob. And then, uh, Hamid, have you got maybe anything to add? I mean, both you and I sit on boards as well as, uh, uh, have sat on boards in the sector as well as being advisors. So kind of possibly see it from both sides of the fence. Yeah, I think, I think it's incredibly challenging, as Robert, Robert says, in terms of, and I think the environment in the next few years is going to be so much so much tougher than, than, than it has been. Um, and I think an element of this, then, it's it's advisors and officers need to make it easy for boards in terms of getting in terms of giving them the right information the right amount of information um and the lens they're giving that information in as well so i think and how i think there needs to be you, you can't have board packs of five i know there's there's a balance between 
inform- giving the right amount of information and um, not giving enough information. But obviously, board packs of 500 pages, flipping heck, that's not easy to... I've had those and they're not good. Um, um, but you need, to, you need to really radically think how your, what information you're giving to boards. You're giving the right information. You're giving enough information to make those, those decisions. And, and again, I suppose that links into, you know, we talked before about the ESG piece. The yeah. governance piece links into this in terms of how, what information our boards get in and how they didn't use uh, and how you, you're asking them to make the decisions and how they prioritize and that. Now, I've seen, I'm seeing, some of my clients, because you know I do both external audit and, and internal audit, um, and some of the a massive reduction in reporting packs and a real just a summary of terms of those key issues, and then a proper discussion at board around around that. We need more information. Well, there's another pack there as well. So it's really, I think that piece around for boards in terms of making those decisions has to yeah is there's around some of the, some of that what's provided to them and thinking about are you providing. Are you making it easy for them to make those to make those get those priorities right in the future? Thank you, Hamid. And uh, I guess what I'd add for me, it's um, I always try and come back to kind of what's our core purpose for a board. You know, and what are we here to actually achieve? What 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 have we set out are our, our reasons for being here? And it, and um, and we should be able to map decision making and in, and indeed therefore priorities back to that kind of core purpose and that that rationale for existence and and if it starts to kind of stretch away from that then I think that's where where you know advisors and and and, and indeed management should be saying to Paul hang on a minute I think this is we're, we're moving away from our core purpose and I think it's interesting and important I think to keep coming back to that question so on board away days or those sort of things around kind of why are we here and what are we what's important to us. So there are some things we clearly have to do. So landlord, health and safety compliance, we need, we, you know, there's a bar there that has to be met. But then beyond what you have to do, well, what are we here to do? What do we want to do? What's our ambition? And then all these other things kind of layer in on top of that. Uh, so I guess that's the way I try and think about it. And certainly when I was on a board and I'm looking at the information coming to me, sort of the question I would ask is, well, is this part, is this, is this really what we're here to do? And if it is, then then to Robert's point earlier, let's just, yeah, you want to throw everything at it, but but if it's slightly outside, then maybe that's when you start challenging whether it's something that we should be investing time, resources, and our skills, and particularly because we've discussed through the course of this conversation, some of those are in scarce supply at the moment. So yeah, yeah. Um, William, anything to perhaps well, add? I, I was just going to agree, Phil. I think I think it's I think it's really a, a question of identity. Um, at, at the board level about what, what is the organisation trying to do and its strategy. And risk appetite can sometimes help try to explain that. Um, but for organisations that haven't really got really detailed risk appetite statements in place to help drive executive decision making, sometimes it's easier to um, explain in the negative. So we don't want to be doing this and we, we don't want to be doing that. So start carving off the things you don't want to do. So, so an example might be, you know, around tackling the environmental reinvestment question, um, you'll have to go through some kind of options appraisal process to say, well, if it's going to, there'll come a threshold where it's going to cost me more money to retrofit this property than it's going to be to just dispose of the property and take that money and, and reinvest it somewhere else. And then you, you get into all those questions about what are we trying to do? What tenures of housing are we trying to support for our customers um, the locations that we're trying to do that um, and then in the context of the white paper to what degree do we want to engage with our customers around non-landlord related support services um, you know and that that comes at a cost to the organization as well so um, I think I think whatever decision boards make it's really important that they explain why they're making that decision but also almost like explain why they aren't making other decisions. So if it comes at the expense of something else, being really clear about why they're not doing something and then tying that back to the corporate strategy or the, the, the corporate vision um, of the organisation. If I could just um, come in as well, from our point of view, it's really interesting, William, because we've done a lot of that work um, in terms of really understanding why we're doing stuff. But the other the other piece to that is the kind of the intended and unintended consequences of that. 
So if you look at the, for example, our, our board have made a clear statement, you know, they don't want to outsource the problems of our poorest stock to the private sector. They want to try and tackle it. But there are real challenges to that in terms of fun the funding model for regeneration, which at the moment, you know, there isn't significant funding for regeneration. Um, and then alongside that, you've got additional housing management costs, because if you can exit a difficult area, you've dealt with a number of issues, including intensive management, including customer satisfaction levels. So you really have to explore with the board, you know, OK, here's a decision which might be, do you know what, we really want to be um, earnest about our approach to, to tackling the, the, the carbon uh, agenda. And that means holding on to difficult stock and finding solutions for it, whether that be, you know, a fabric first approach or, or, in, or regeneration. But then looking down the road and saying, OK, if we make this decision, what does that mean for us going forward in terms of things like management costs per unit and... Um, and satisfaction levels and are we prepared for all of those things when one day the regulator will publish you know a list a load of stats and we won't look so great um and and i think that's the other piece that we need to be doing with board um so that there's no, you know a kind of no surprises approach to some of these strategic decisions that we're asking the board to make so I think for me, Robert, that's really important because I mean, that comes back to two things. One is uh, telling your story and you, you talk about telling the story effectively. And I guess that's both internally and externally, but also it's about in the end, it's about, I guess, doing the right thing and doing the thing that you want to do. Not and, and not because the regulator or indeed anybody else says you have to do it. It's standing back saying, well, what are we here to do and why are we doing it? And we're confident that we're making good decisions. So for the right purpose. And I think, um, yeah, it should it shouldn't be about what the regulator or someone else says. It should be about what's the right decision for this organisation, taken by the people who really know the organisation and your customers and, and and such like. And um, again, I think that's a really important theme. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've hit. Uh, uh, we've had a good uh, can through for, uh, well, good, gosh, forty minutes on that. So that was uh, uh, hopefully really interesting for people listening. I certainly enjoyed it. I know perhaps if we could go under the concluding slide um just to sum up i think uh so uh what today was was the launch of our barometer it was the uh i guess a, a bit of the kind of key themes key flavors from it uh, there's a you know a full document that supports it uh behind which um uh certainly will be pushing out to the people on this call and those people who actually responded to the survey to help us create it and over the next 24 hours, you should get that into your inbox. Um, the version will also be up on our website at the address that you can see at the bottom of this slide, uh, probably over the next uh, 48 hours or so, certainly by the middle, uh, sorry, certainly by the end of this week, uh, hopefully sooner. Um, and then from a BDO perspective, we will be, I guess, taking some of the themes from the survey uh, and beginning to produce, uh, I guess, little videos and, and, and more uh, for thought uh, leadership hopefully and commentary which will be uh, I guess pushing out to uh, uh, clients and, and others um, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say at this stage I particularly wanted to thank uh, uh, Rob for joining us today I, I really much appreciate to get that kind of really in-depth client view of, of some of the challenges we we're talking about clearly as you know as ever it's a there's a lot of competing priorities and a fast changing environment, but I think that's what makes it interesting um, and, and for all of us. So um, uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Hamid and William for uh, joining me today. Um, and uh, with that, we shall sign off and look forward to catching up with people soon. Many thanks. Thank you.